Now we finally have the weapon to do something useful. We are going to look at an actual heap code for vector addition. We will walk through the program step by step. We will look at specific bits of code and try to understand what all of these codes do. Before we look at the code, let's remind ourselves how vector addition works. In this example, we have three arrays called A, B, and C. The array C will contain the sum of corresponding elements in array A and array B. We will be using a small array of size 10 just to make it easier to understand. Now let's take a look at a CPU implementation of vector addition. This C++ code has a function named CPU vector add that performs element-wise addition of two input float arrays A and B of size N. The result of the addition is stored in an output float array C. The code initializes two arrays A and B with constant values of 1.0 and 2.0 single precision floating point numbers respectively. Then it allocates memory for the output array C. After that, the CPU vector add function is called to perform the vector addition. The core to this function is a big for loop. In each iteration, we add two numbers and store the sum to the third array. There, as we discussed in section two, we can analyze if there is any cross iteration dependency. Luckily, there is no dependency in this example. Therefore, we can execute each iteration in parallel. So let's convert this loop to GPU threads. Now let's look at the GPU implementation of vector addition. The GPU implementation requires the inclusion of a specific header to use the heap runtime calls. This header provides access to the functions and structures that allow the programmer to manage the CPU devices, allocate and copy memory, launch kernels, and synchronize the execution of the program between the CPU and the GPU. In this code, we will be using macros to make our code more reusable and efficient. Using macros, we can define a constant value of n, which is an integer argument representing the number of elements in each array. Let's take a look at the kernel. The kernel is defined as a regular function with this special global specifier. So when we talk about the kernel, we are referring to the function that is executed by each thread in parallel on the GPU. In this case, the kernel takes the pointers to the output array C and input arrays A and B along with the size of the arrays as parameters. Inside the kernel, the first thing we see is the thread indexing. This is the process of giving each thread a unique number for each block in a grid. Each thread is responsible for performing one addition. So the corresponding output of the addition of array A and B will be stored in the C array. The next step is to check whether the global thread ID index is within the bounds of our arrays. This is done using a conditional if statement. When we launch the kernel, the number of threads must form whole blocks. However, the size of the array may not be a multiple of the block size. Some threads may not be able to map to any data points. Therefore, we have to perform this boundary check to guarantee memory safety. Each thread that passes this conditional bound check is simply taking an element from the arrays A and B, adding them and storing the sum in the C array. Overall, the kernel function is responsible for parallelizing the addition operation across multiple threads on the GPU to achieve faster execution times. Let's go through the CPU code step by step. We start by declaring pointer variables of data type float. These pointers will be used to store the memory addresses of our input and output arrays. We have three pointer variables, A, B, and C, which is corresponding to the input arrays and the output arrays respectively. We also have three more pointer variables, d underscore a, d underscore b, and d underscore c, which will be used to store the memory addresses of the input and output arrays in the device memory. The reason for this is that we will be copying the input arrays from the host memory to the device memory before performing the vector addition on the GPU and then we will copy the resulting array back to the host memory. Next, we use the memory allocation function malloc to allocate space in the host memory for the input and output arrays. 
we allocate space for n floats in each array. In this block of code, we are generating the input array on the host. The input arrays A and B are initialized with constant values of 1.0 and 2.0 single precision floating point numbers respectively. For memory allocation on the device, we use heap malloc with two arguments, the pointer and the size of the memory to allocate. Heap malloc means allocate the data on the GPU, whereas a plain malloc would mean allocate the data on the CPU. Here, the input arrays are D underscore A, D underscore B, and the resulting array is D underscore C. Here, we are copying the data from the CPU to the GPU. We use heap mem copy, which is similar to the regular CMEM copy, but with one additional argument to specify the direction of the transfer. In this case, we are transferring data from the host to the device, so we use heap mem copy host to device as the fourth argument. The first three arguments of heap mem copy are similar to the regular CMEM copy, which are the destination, source, and the number of bytes. Here, the destinations are the GPU memory pointers D underscore A and D underscore B, and the sources are the CPU memory points A and B. Now, our next task is to launch a kernel which performs vector addition of two input arrays and stores the result in the output array. But at first, we need to define the size of the block, which is the number of the threads that will be executed in parallel, and here it is set to 256. There is no magic good numbers for the block size that always performs the best, but typically we want to use either 64, 128 or 256. And then we calculate the number of blocks, represented by the grid size variable. Grid size is measured by the number of blocks that we need to create. One important factor to consider is that n may not be a multiple of block size. If we divide, we need to round up. Here we use this trick to perform a division that automatically rounds up by adding a block size minus 1 to the array size n. Following this, the heap launch operator launches the kernel function on the GPU device, passing in the device pointers to the output array d underscore c, input arrays d underscore a and d underscore b, and the size of the arrays n as arguments. This tells the GPU to execute the kernel function on the data on the device, performing vector addition of the input arrays and storing the result in the output array. Finally, heap device synchronized function is used to wait until the kernel execution on the device is complete before processing with the CPU code execution. This ensures that the CPU does not access any data that is still being processed by the GPU. After executing the kernel, we copy the result from the variable d underscore c on the GPU back to the CPU using the heap mem copy. This heap mem copy call will move memory from device to host and place it in the variable c. After moving data back to the CPU, we print out the first index of the resulting array. Finally, we release the memory that was allocated on both the CPU and GPU. This is done using the free function for CPU memory and heap free function for GPU memory. Finally, the function returns zero to indicate successful execution. After comparing the execution times of the vector addition application of both the CPU and GPU, we observed that the GPU implementation has an execution of 1.52 milliseconds, while the CPU implementation has an execution time of 19.36 milliseconds. This means that the GPU implementation is around 19 times faster than the CPU implementation, making it a more time efficient option for vector addition. This graph compares the execution time of vector addition on CPU and GPU. For small vector sizes, the GPU execution time is higher than the CPU execution time. However, as the vector size increases, the GPU execution time reduces significantly, outperforming the CPU execution time. Therefore, for applications that involve large amount of data, using the GPU for processing can result in significant improvements in performance compared to the CPU. The next video will cover the implementation of square matrix multiplication using HIP.